Lipot. This is Anna Jaworski recording today's program from Budapest, Hungary. I'm actually in the same studio with your regular host, Michael Lieben, but for today's program, we're switching roles. Instead of being his producer, I will be his host, and Michael will be this month's guest, as well as his wife, Leora, and my husband, Frank Jaworski. Michael Lieben and I have known each other for 20 years, but only through the internet. When I told him I was going to Budapest with my husband because he was attending a conference, Michael told me that he and his wife would meet us in Budapest so we could finally meet face to face. So here we are in Budapest, both of us with our spouses, and we've had quite an experience. We thought all of you might like to hear about some of the things we've discovered together. Today's episode is called Living with a Culture of Grief, and we will be discussing our unique experiences here in Budapest, Hungary in June 2018. Let's go ahead and start by discussing the most moving experience you've had in Budapest. And Leora, I'd like to start with you. I thought that it was the visit at the synagogue, and later on, I did the new, the shoes. Yeah. I thought that was really moving to... Yes, it was really... Yeah, let's tell our listeners what this is, because if they've never been to Hungary or Budapest before, they may not know the story. Can you explain the story of the shoes along the banks of the Danube River? This, what, this happened during the Holocaust, and it was near the end of the of, war. Of the war. Mm-hmm. And uh, actually, the Jews of uh, Hungary mm-hmm. were the last to be taken. And uh, they brought them to the, the new. And they shut them. And it's horrible. They, they made them they, take their shoes off. Yes. And they shut them. So that they fell into the they river. Fell into the river. And died uh, during this action. There were uh, hundreds of people that they did at one time, didn't they say? Yes. Uh, actually, 10% right. of, uh, of all the of Jews, all the Jews mm-hmm. were from Hungary. Yeah. I had no idea that there were so many people taken from this one country. Yes. Who were murdered and at the last moment. At the last moment. moment. Yeah. It was, it was, like you said, it was heartbreaking. It was yes. absolutely heartbreaking. Michael, what was the most moving moment for you in our visit here in, in Budapest? I, I think it came by accident. We were walking and we passed something that we had seen the night before, but it was dark and we didn't know what it was. And it was a wall that was one of the walls of the ghetto, and it's the only one that's left. And suddenly I realized, I'm standing right in front of the ghetto, and this is my first experience with being in a place where a piece of the Holocaust happened. And so suddenly I was face to face with reality. It wasn't a memorial, it wasn't a monument, it wasn't a picture, and it wasn't in another country. It was here. And then a little bit later, in the same day, I think we were at the synagogue in a courtyard, and they said, Look to the left, there's a yellow building. Look to the right, there's a yellow building. And that is the entire border of the, I think it was less than a quarter mile of the right. ghetto, in which they had so many people squeezed in. And, and suddenly you realize you're standing in. The ghetto, and you know that people came in here, but very few came out of here, and you're physically on the spot. And that was a very moving moment for me because my education had always been to remember and to relive. And in the same way that on Passover we read the Haggadah, we're told to read as if we ourselves came out of Egypt. In my generation, they spent a lot of time and effort and making us feel as if we ourselves had come through the Holocaust. And just to keep it clear, I'm 59 years old. My father was an American soldier in World War II, so I'm the next generation 
And so there's something in me that makes me feel as if I had been there. And a lot of people tried very hard to make me feel that way as a child. And so suddenly now we're all connected, like someone's plugged in the power and it ripped right through me in a way that I had really not expected. And that was, that was really difficult. And I think that's why calling today's episode Living with a Culture of Grief mm-hmm. was so important because the culture you grew up in mm-hmm. taught you about the Holocaust as if it happened to you, yeah. even though it didn't happen to you. So even though you didn't experience it firsthand, you have lived all your life with this culture of grief of what was done to your people. And then this week, mm-hmm. I, I clued into it and, and almost felt like I experienced it firsthand. It was a very deep reaction. I had not expected. I had expected that I would come up against it, and I expected that it would be more cold, and that I would feel angry. And I came up against it totally unprepared and totally unexpected that first time. And the second time, I I sort of knew where I was going, because I was already in the synagogue and its compound, but it hit me again, and I wasn't prepared, and it really just threw me over in a way. I wasn't angry, I was very, very sad. I was very, very upset. And I nearly lost it. I'm not sure exactly how to describe that, but it was more than anger. It wasn't anything I thought I would feel. I thought I would come back to this a generation later and be strong and be cold and sort of in your face this. I couldn't do it. Watching you go through this, I got the feeling that it was visceral for you, that you felt it very deep inside. So Frank, both of us are Christians. So we are coming at this whole experience with a different perspective. What was the most moving experience you've had here in Budapest? The most moving experience I had here was, and I was deeply moved by the Jewish Museum and by the, the shoes of the Danian. What was surprised me was outside of the park, outside of the museum, there's the Raoul Wallenberg Park. Raoul Wallenberg was a, an ambassador to Hungary from one of the Scandinavian nations, and he took it upon himself personally to try to rescue as many of the Jews as he could. And so in the park, there is a tree, and it's a, it's a metal tree, it's a weeping willow. And from a distance, it looks like a beautiful metal sculpture of a weeping willow. So when you walk toward it, you see the beauty of the tree. But as you get closer, you can see that each one of the leaves on the tree has a name engraved on it, and it's one of the people that Wallenberg saved. Mm-hmm. And the power of that, going from the beautiful image of the tree to the realization these are people who were saved, literally pulled back from death by this man who himself lost his life. Right. That was designed that way, I think, to intentionally take you off guard and make it very strong. And it made me stop in my tracks and it brought tears to my eyes. Yeah. The other thing that really touched me in that same area in the garden was a huge stained glass window that was done, the symbolism that was explained to us in the stained glass window was very powerful, where they were talking about how the flames reached up, but they couldn't reach the heavens. And that really touched me. My husband and I have been taking some stained glass classes. And so for me, seeing how a a wonderful artist took that image of something that was so horrific and made something beautiful out of it. To me, that really touched and spoke to me. But I loved the tree as well. That was a surprise. And Michael actually took a lovely photograph close up where you could actually see the names written on the leaves. And they said that they're still adding leaves to the trees as they find out more names. Uh, it, It really is so touching. And I didn't expect to see all of this in Budapest. Did you? Did any of you? We knew a little bit about it because we had read about it. But until you really see it, 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 it's hard to understand. And I think there's a lot of things here. It's not just the art. It's not just the memorial. First of all, I'm, I'm pleased and a little bit proud that the Hungarian government saw fit to recognize this mm-hmm. and to memorialize this. They don't hide it. We're not proud of it. Uh, at the museum, that's when we found out the numbers. Right. That, that 600,000 Jews were taken from Hungary 
at the very end, fast and furious and gone. Um, it's a fact that they're willing to own up to. And you see these monuments and you see these buildings, but... I think that it's so heinous and it's so vivid and it's a... It's catching you off guard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, anything you can think about or prepare for isn't going to help you. Right. Yes. I mean, I saw pictures of the shoes on the Danube. Right. But it wasn't the same as when we were walking right there yeah. next to it. And, and you could see instantly, the river. Yeah. And right. suddenly you see, like, a boy's shoes. Right. Uh, a woman's. Elegant shoes, a men's shoes. Plus, people and had brought flowers and ribbons and, and, and candles. Yes, yes. In the, you can, I think that you cannot prepare yourself for this. Right, I don't think you can either. It's a moment that catching you off guard. Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home Tonight Forever. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Michael. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on Michael's program, please email him at michael at hearttoheartwithmichael.com. Now, back to our program. I knew that I was coming to Eastern Europe, which was not going to be fun for that. I knew that I had told myself for years I didn't really want to go to Eastern Europe because of that. And here I am in Eastern Europe, um, not knowing a whole lot about what happened in Hungary, and, and suddenly coming face to face with massive, a massive chunk of the Holocaust at the very, very end. Mm -hmm. Right here, I, I'm still trying to understand what I saw in, in terms of what it means to me, because I've, on, I've always understood the numbers. I've always understood the impact, I've always, always understood the meaning of it, but it was always something that happened to them mm. over there. Yeah. And our family was fairly lucky. My grandparents had come to America before the war. My father was born in the United States. He was an American soldier. Um, we were on the right side of this. And we didn't know really until the late 70s that we had lost any family at all. So I had always been slightly removed, despite their best educational efforts, removed enough that I could stand aside and look at it. But this week I wasn't aside, I was in the middle of it, and that I still can't fully explain. How appropriate did it seem to you that the day we went and saw that, it was raining? Well, to quote my favorite American author, Kervana Gitchinger, Nature sympathized. Uh, the sky cried with me. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I felt too. The angels were crying. Yeah. So what have you experienced here in Budapest that has helped you understand history a little bit better, Frank? There's a lot of history in Budapest aside from what happened in the Holocaust. Yes, that's true. Tremendous history. Mm -hmm. And People are still very much aware, although unification happened well over 100 years ago, that Buddha and Pest and O Buddha were separate cities. And so there's a, there's a sense of where you live matters in terms of what part of the city you're from. And the flat part in Pest, the hilly part in Buddha, wherever you live. Or the middle part in St. Margaret, Margaret's Island. Mm -hmm. 
the people here seem to be aware of their past in a good way, both for responsibility and the good things that have happened in the past. And there, our conversation with one of our tour guides about the transition away from a socialist economy to a capitalist economy and how the generations of the people in the country right now are progressing through the steps, the development, to become more accepting and, and vital in that economy was fascinating because yeah. they are in the middle of history and they are aware they're in the middle of history. Right. And it changes the way they think every day. Right. That was I thought that was powerful, too, that they recognize that change is not going to happen overnight, that it actually takes a couple of generations before that change is really manifested in such a way that people can take advantage of what not being in a socialist government means to them. So, yeah, I, I would agree with you. I thought that was pretty interesting. And they were so aware of where they have been and where they're coming and where their children will be. And for me, that seemed very optimistic. What did you think about that, Leora? Uh, I agree with you. Uh, the other day when we took the tour with, the, with our guide, uh, I uh, noticed that he is, that they are expecting changes, mm -hmm. that it will take generations and they, they, are, they are very optimistic. Yeah, that was good to see. And yes. <laughs> These are measurable changes. They, right. they know, I don't remember exactly how he put it, but the first generation that experienced communism, the second generation that's in flux, yes. and the third generation that should be able to sell it. And they're very aware of the position. But I want to say also, I'm very optimistic about Hungary. Because the people here are very, very young. I see very few people older, over the age of 55 walking around. And I see a lot of young people. And one of us remarked, I think your remarked, there are no babies. Where are the babies? Soon. Because this is a very young population. And soon I think there's going to be a population explosion. And when you have a very young population, that's where you find forward thinking. That's where you find creative state building. These are the people that are going to make the future. And I think they're ready for it. I really do. I think they had a difficult past. Hungary's, future, Hungary's history is not that long in, in Europe. That's one of the things we learned. Yeah. It's only maybe a thousand years old, a little longer. And it, they're a relatively new country as far as Europe goes. Mm -hmm. and, and they're ready to go with that. They, they seem to have a good understanding of who they are and where they are. And they seem ready to take on the challenge of becoming a modern, forward-thinking state that can participate more actively in the world. And they have history for that. They're part of. They were an ancient, not ancient. They were an empire a couple of centuries ago. I mean, they're they're not new to Europe in that sense, but they they have a great sense of um, presence and a great sense of purpose. I agree with you. I like what you said before, though, about how you appreciate that the Hungarian government mm -hmm. doesn't try to hide behind what happened in the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. How important do you feel it is for us to continue to talk about the Holocaust even today, Michael? I think it's important. I think at some point someone's going to tell me that was a long time ago. And that may be so, but I'm still second generation. My children may already in third generation feel different. But I think one of the things they need to do to not repeat that past is to confront it in a way that's safe for them to confront it, in a way that won't make them feel bad or embarrassed, but they need to be aware of it. They need to be aware of their history, and that's a part of their history. I'm still working through how I have to relate to this differently or not. Um, I mean, I broke my rule. I said I would never step foot in Eastern Europe, and here I am. <laughs> um, I've said something crazy silly, like maybe I'll come back. <laughs> uh, my parents had been to Prague, and somehow we're okay with it. I, I think that barrier is breaking down, but it breaks down well in places where 
I feel confident that they are handling their past. Mm -hmm. If they were hiding their past, or I felt that anti-Semitism was on the rise again, or they were not learning a lesson from the past, I might feel differently. I might be a lot stronger about beating them over the head with it. I may not have to do that. My generation may not have to do that. My children's generation may not have to do that. If they can show... I mean, we, we... it's a generation, two generations later, but I would be happy if somehow they apologized to me both. I don't know how to explain that because it's a ridiculous concept, but if I feel that they're making amends in some way, then I can relax. So I feel I need to be on guard. And, and I'm a little bit happier about it. That's good. That's good to know that this visit has helped to maybe break down some barriers for you yeah. about the prejudice you felt towards this part of, of the world. I think both of us have a long way to go. Both of us have a long way to go. But I have seen here the willingness to confront it, at least in a dispassionate way. They, they know the numbers, they can say things. The synagogue is an open site. People are on the line around the block to get in. People are interested in museum is alive and well. The community is alive and well. The synagogues are alive and well. Um, Protected. And protected, but more than that, every yeah. Israeli I told, they said, I'm coming to Budapest. They said, Oh, you're going to love it. And apparently, I'm the last Israeli who's going to Budapest. <laughs>
and I wish the East Europeans well, and as long as they are here, may they remember it too. And if we can find a way to perhaps jointly commemorate, then I think we'll be, we'll be in a better position in the world. So how do you think you're working through the grief of what has happened to your people? Because it sounds like this has touched you very personally and your entire generation, just with the way your religion teaches you to remember. Well, I think I'm totally in delay. I think I'm reliving the Holocaust now in a way that I never did. Despite all the training, all the, all the learning and reading and, and everything, I've, everything I've ever been told and everything I know, um, I would not have had this moment of release had I not been here. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why we as Israelis send our children to Poland in the 12th grade, to give them that moment of release. And maybe afterwards that's okay then to go on and continue in the world. And, and maybe put, not to put it aside, but put it in a place where we can continue to be members of the world with the descendants of those who did this and try and find a better path with those descendants and recognize they're not the ones who did this. Maybe they're, you know, I, for years, every time I see somebody, I'll, I'll, where was your father in World War II? That's my favorite little thing in my head. Where was your grandfather in World War II? That's a serious question. It's something that, that needs to be laid to rest. But if I could have a, a, a more meaningful dialogue with those people, then we could we could come to an understanding that would allow us to live together in a way that we're not constantly looking at each other and thinking about it. Right. So it's almost a way that you can make amends with the past so that you can build a better future. With the people here who clearly are not alone. Right. Yeah. Right. It's hard for me to disassociate this generation from the past generation. At some point we'll have to. Mm-hmm. At some point we'll have to. I mean, if there was still a Roman Empire... We would have to come to terms with the Romans who 2,000 years ago destroyed the temple and the last independent Jewish state for 2,000 years. If there was still a Babylonia, we would have to come to terms with them because they would still be here. But there is an Eastern Europe, and there are Hungarians, and there are Germans, and there are Poles, and we have to come to terms with how we want to live with them. And I have a feeling I'm among the last to have to go through this. I think... A lot of people have already for years have told me, come on, different generation, it's okay. And I haven't been able to let go. But maybe, maybe, by confronting it personally on that physical kind of level, maybe I can. But I needed to come to do that. Yeah. yeah. I think listening to the tour guides and going through the museums and visiting the memorials is touching no matter what your background is. But walking with the two of you by our sides definitely gave us a a different perspective that made it even more meaningful to us. So, yeah, I'm glad that we could meet us here and we could go through this together. And that concludes a special episode of Heart to Heart with Michael. Hope you'll tune in again next year when we start Season 3. The thing that we have to remember in any case is that how we remember our loved ones is how they will be remembered. Our loved ones will always be with us as long as we keep their memories alive. Thank you again for joining us. We hope you have gained strength from listening to our program. Heart to Heart with Michael can be heard every Thursday at noon Eastern Time. We'll talk again next time when we'll share more stories.